Hi everybody, my name is Aaron and welcome back to my channel. First things first, we have some incredible breaking Scientology news. We had a rare public sighting of David Miscavige in Clearwater this week. Miscavige was captured on film, being dropped off outside of a Scientology property on Fort Harrison Avenue. Here is a clip from that footage. Amazing. Miscavige really is a tiny, angry little fella. Miscavige is five foot one, and even that might be an exaggeration. Miscavige is so tiny and petite, it would almost be adorable if he weren't so evil. My kids have these little plush toys called uh, Squishamoles, or uh, it might be Squishmallows. They look like this little guy right here. Every time I see them, I think of David Miscavige. There's a bigger version of these. This might be a, this might be a little more life size, but uh, harder to fit on camera. I'll tell you what though, someone should really make like a plush toy a David Miscavige plush toy, like a Halloween edition so that he's like a little devil. And when you squeeze him, he says things that David Miscavige would actually say like, Tom, nobody gets me like you do. Nobody understands us, Tom. Or, what are you doing about that f sucker Mike Rinder and that f Leah Remini? What's that f Leah Remini doing now? Or, where the f is Shelly? That f thinks I'm gonna do all the work. I'll tell you what, if somebody actually made something like that, and they wanted to donate like a portion of the proceeds to the Aftermath Foundation, I would 100% promote that on this channel. All right, on to business. Today's video is an interview I did with my friend, Chris Shelton. Chris uploaded this video to his channel with his permission, I'm uploading it to my channel as well. So if you're watching this on my channel, check out Chris over, well, the name of his channel is just Chris Shelton. He has a podcast called The Sensibly Speaking Podcast, and that's what this interview was for. Chris also wrote a book called A to Zenu, and if you are interested in all things Scientology, definitely check that book out. In this interview, we talk about all things Clearwater, we talk about Scientology and COVID, we talk about whether Scientology is really trying to bring a ton of Scientologists to Clearwater or not. Um, anyway, we talk about a bunch of things. So without further ado, here's my interview with Chris. Hello and welcome to the Sensibly Speaking Podcast. This is Chris Shelton, the critical thinker at large, coming at you for another hour of podcasting greatness this week with Aaron Smith-Levin. You can see as my guest. Hey, Aaron, welcome back to the show. <laughs> Hey, Chris. Good to be with you. Yeah, good to be with you. I uh, I really do feel like we should do this more. <laughs> I um, I have been very excited lately to uh, to see your public uh, announcements now that you are running for city council for Clearwater in this next election. When do those w w tell us when when do those ha when do those elections happen and and what are you doing there? So the campaign season officially starts sometime in September. Okay. Um, and just to be cognizant of any election laws, Scientology will try to uh, accuse me of having violated. I cannot say I am a candidate. I can say I will be a candidate for city council. Um, so in the course of the interview, if I, if I sort of say I am running or that's why I am running, it really means why I will be running. Got it. Um, so the, uh, once you, until you file the paperwork, which can't be filed until some date in September, I don't remember what the date is until you filed the paperwork, uh, you're, you're not officially a candidate. You haven't started a campaign and you can't say that you have. So okay. having said all of that, <laughs> um, I will be running for city council this year. The candidates, uh, the, the campaigns will start sometime in September. Uh, they, the campaign lasts for six months and the elections are in March. And, um, I cannot be more excited for the, the, the six month campaign season. I mean, you know, when Mark Bunker won his seat on the council, uh, I really thought that was going to be a pivotal thing in changing the perception of how much influence Scientology has in Clearwater. Mm -hmm. And I sort of get the sense that, um, that people aren't really paying attention to Clearwater. Like the people who really, really care are paying attention, but the public at large are not. And, and let's be honest, why would they be? Like, why would anyone be paying attention to Clearwater? Um, and I want to use this I want to use this as an opportunity. I want to use hopefully being on the council as an opportunity to rub Scientology's face in the fact that they have no actual influence in Clearwater. And I'm going to make sure everybody understands it. I'm going to make sure business leaders understand it, investors understand it, developers understand it. And I already do that privately behind the scenes. But I'm getting a little tired of having to sort of educate people behind the scenes when it can be done much more effectively and much more broadly um, from the pulpit of the city council. Yeah. Like every city council meeting is recorded and is a live public meeting. Well, I want to use every meeting as an opportunity 
uh, not just to bring up Scientology, but to show everyone Scientology has no influence. And, um, you know, sometimes people get rubbed the wrong way when I say that. Um, even people who really uh, dislike Scientology. Um, and so I want to make sure I'm very clear about what I mean when I say that. Yeah. Scientology's presence has had a major influence on Clearwater, a major negative influence. So I'm not, I don't mean that they don't have any impact. I mean, they as an organization don't have what you would call actual influence. Right. They don't have pull. They don't have um, connections and relationships that allow them to forward their agenda in Clearwater. They don't have any sympathy or cooperation from elected officials or even business leaders or community leaders. Now, Somebody might say, well, if that's already true, then what, how do you hope to, um, then what change is there for you to make? I want that to be publicly obvious. Even though I'm sitting here saying Scientology has no influence in Clearwater, um, worth speaking of, people still don't understand that. There's still a perception that they do. Mm -hmm. Because those who are, um, let's say the community leaders, the political leaders, they might privately agree with me that Scientology has no real influence, but they're not willing to publicly say it and make it obvious. You know, like they're not willing to try to change public perception about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to change public perception about that. I'm sick and tired of people thinking Scientology runs this town. I'm sick and tired of people thinking Scientology has people on the city council or has the city manager in its pocket or that the police work for Scientology. None of these things are true. And the people in leadership positions here in Clearwater know that these things aren't true, but they're not willing to do and say the things necessary to change public perception about that because they're too worried about being diplomatic. They're too worried about pissing off Scientology. And that last part is what I really take issue with. Mm -hmm. In order to change public perception, you have to stop acting like you're supposed to be careful about pissing off Scientology. You have to show everybody that these people don't have enough influence to worry about whether you piss them off or not. The fact that people walk on eggshells around them is actually what contributes to the perception that they have a lot of influence and power in this town. And it's just not true. Um, so changing public perception about Clearwater is my main incentive, my main motive for running for city council. I think Clearwater is actually going in a very good direction right now, although it's having trouble getting there. Um, you know, we, we're searching for a new city manager right now. Almost everybody dropped out and they're having to go back to the drawing board and, and, and put out another request for applications. Um, they're trying to develop some properties on the bluff to, um, to redevelop downtown Clearwater and they're, they're having... Some, some trouble and obstacles with that. Um, we're in the middle of a project called Imagine Clearwater, which is like a $65 million renovation of Coachman Park to basically bring non-Scientologists back to downtown. There's some big hurdles with that right now. So um, my, my general belief is that if anything is going to hold Clearwater back, is if anything is going to prevent investment and development, it's going to be people's misunderstanding that they should be afraid of Scientology. Right. And if I can add anything to the board, it's gonna be my efforts to change that perception. And maybe that perception can't be changed, we'll find out. But I genuinely believe that if it can be changed, I'm the one in Clearwater who has the best chance of making that happen. And we'll see if it works or not, but it is why I'm running. Um, and it's why I expect to have a lot of community support. And I don't actually expect, expect to have the support of um, what one might call the establishment. The establishment, I think, is to blame for the status quo. Mm. And the establishment includes things like the mayor's best friend also representing Scientology and development deals. And I'm like, how can you be running a city and one of your best friends is representing the organization that has declared war on the city you're running? Right. Like these, these conflicts of interest that the people in power would probably deny are actually conflicts of interest. I'm just kind of like, I'm done with it. I'm done with it. You know, the status quo isn't working that great. Um, and I hope to at least be somewhat effective in trying to change it. And so the campaign, I'm really just going to be rubbing Miscavige's face every single day in the fact that there's not a damn thing him or any Scientologist can do um, to keep me from hopefully winning this campaign. I mean, I'm not saying I'm guaranteed to win. I'm saying that if I lose, it won't be because of anything Scientology does. Got it. And um, 
none of the people that are considered uh, Scientologists who are business leaders in the community, none of these guys have have the balls to step up and run for public office because they know how embarrassing it would end up being to Scientology. Mm. Like, I mean, you know what I mean? Like the fact that no one's run, like this is an example of something a lot of people don't understand about Clearwater. Not only has a Scientologist never been on the city council, a Scientologist has never even attempted to run for a city council because it would just be a a massive embarrassment. You know, Scientology claims to have about 15,000 Scientologists living in Clearwater. There aren't even 15,000 Scientologists living in all of Tampa Bay. Right. And, <laughs> and if there were 15,000 Scientologists living in Clearwater, the city council would be stacked with Scientologists. And um, so anyway, um, I'm just going to be rubbing Scientology's face in it yeah. seven days a week, all six months, that, um, and, and om- almost daring them to do something about it. Because you know they're not going to be able to help but to do some really foolish things. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. And and I'm going to be like do it all. Do throw throw your worst at me. I'm going to use it to make you look foolish. Like I almost don't even care what they do to me at this point. Wow. You know. Wow. Like the worse the better. I mean, <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? <laughs> well, like, you know, you're you are it, it's a it's an awesome thing you're doing right now because of course you're shouting from the rooftops, come at me motherfuckers, right? But at the same time, um, th- it actually is ballsy because you're in Miscavige's backyard here. This is not like, you know, he's not over in Hemet anymore. He's not, he doesn't focus on California. He's, he's really focused there, it seems, from what we're hearing or seeing. Is that consistent with what you were perceiving? Well, I'll give you my opinion on that. Yeah. Do I believe that he's actually in town and has been in town for a long time? Yes, I do. Mm. Um, do I think that has some greater significance in the world of Scientology? Um, I don't. Uh, and here's why. Uh, you and I both know there have been times in the past where Miscavige has spent extended amount of times in yes. Clearwater. I mean, That's right. one obvious example is the whole Lisa McPherson thing. Yep. Did he really need to be here during that? No. Did he feel a desire to be? Yes. Um, another example would have been around the 96 era for the Golden Age of yep. Tech stuff. That's right. Um, I guarantee you something was similar for Golden Age of Tech 2. Um well, then now they're starting the the new OEC evolution for the the management teams worldwide. Okay. Miscavige has a reason to be here. Um, I would also point out that for the church to come out and publicly say Miscavige resides in Clearwater now um, means it's convenient for them to say that because if that were true, why the fuck would they tell everybody that? The, uh, so the church has some interest or motivation or something to gain by saying Miscavige lives here. Right. Even if only maybe that makes it harder for them to serve him because it's a giant base and no one's like, do you know what I mean? Oh yeah. Like, oh well, yeah. Why would this be the one thing we believe Scientology is being honest about? Miscavige doesn't live anywhere. It's just, where is it most convenient for the church to say he is a resident? And I don't claim to know the exact reason why it's convenient for them right now. So I guess on the one hand, I'm saying, Sure, Miscavige is in town and probably has been for a long time. On the other hand, I don't think it has any greater significance other than the fact that you've got this OEC evolution happening, other than the fact that you've got a lot of stuff happening in the city of Clearwater that Miscavige wants to sort of know exactly what's going on instantly. We're getting a new city manager. We're getting a new city attorney. We've got council elections coming up that are important. We've got these um, bluff developments um, stuff happening, which, by the way, I don't want to get too far off on a tangent, but the whole development of the bluff is probably one of Miscavige's biggest concerns. This is basically giant hotels, condo buildings, multi-use residential commercial things being built right behind the Fort Harrison and right next to the Oak Cove. David Miscavige already went to war with David Yates and the Clearwater Marine Aquarium simply over purchasing uh, or not being able to purchase a property. One can only imagine the lengths he's going to go to, to fight basically the Taj Mahal being built behind flat. So he, he's got a few reasons to want to be here right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it, it's just these, uh, these subject based reasons. I, I don't think he's like necessarily making Clearwater his home. I think eventually okay. he'll decide he hates everybody here too, and he'll find somewhere else to go. Just like, <laughs> just like happened. at the end <laughs> Well, he can certainly, go to live in the apartment behind ASI. He can certainly go live on the 
uh, what was it, the fifth floor of the main building, right, in, in PAC. Yeah. He's got that entire sure. wing that is his, that is nothing but his apartment space locked up, right? He's got yeah. other places he can go, prob- certainly in the UK and, and, and other places in the world. But it's it, – I'm not conjecturing here or saying that this is the case, but it would be thought by a lot of people – that it could be a a portent or a sign if he's you know officially in clearwater that that the church is pulling in their flippers you know it's becoming even smaller and the main concentration of money influence and power in scientology is undoubtedly clearwater so he would want to make his last stand there so to speak i think that's a hasty judgment i don't think that that's what's happening at all i think it's more in line with what you just said but what would you say to people who are saying, oh, yeah, no, that's that it, Scientology is imploding and, and, and this is Miscavige's last safe place to be in the world or something, you know? Well, those are two different things, whether whether Scientology is imploding and therefore resources are being consolidated or whether uh, the last sentence you said was more like Miscavige is like, uh, did you say hiding? here? Uh, yeah, what, what I said the last, the last safe said? place for him is what I was. Going out oh, well, see, I, I think those are two different things. Fair um, enough. Flag might be the safest place for him uh, if he has to, uh, if people have to know where he is. If people don't have to know where he is, there's a million other places he could be that nobody would ever find him. That's right. So the fact that he's here at Flag to me doesn't indicate he's trying to be safe. If he wants to be really safe, nobody would even know where he is. They sure as hell wouldn't be announcing where the fuck he is. Exactly. So I throw away the whole, this is the safe place for him to be as a motivation. Um, as far as Scientology shrinking, I think for someone to truly believe that they would have to not really understand how Scientology management um, works because uh, that that would imply there was what? Uh, Miscavige there, can't be doing two things at the same time. He can't be putting um, nonstop pressure on continental management units and local orgs to expand while also having a strategy that reflects a shrinking Scientology. Like one of the only things that allows Miscavige to retain power is the belief on the part of all Scientologists that Scientology is massively expanding and Miscavige is pretty much the sole cause of that. Right. So executing a strategy um, that reflects a shrinking Scientology doesn't even work and wouldn't even enter into Miscavige's mindset particularly. I agree. Um, and, and you and I know from conversations we've had off screen that there's still as much pressure to expand Scientology orgs on a local basis and on a continental basis than there ever has been. Um, you know, uh, and not with any success. <laughs> no, see, that's you know. the thing. I mean, from a, and it's and, and admittedly, I think it's gone in waves because there have been times where we've looked at how the orgs are being dealt with. And I have said straight up from a former manager perspective, these orgs are being ignored. Nobody's trying to manage these places. Right. And then you see other things happen, as is what's happening more recently. At, which we'll get to, and you go, oh yeah, no, these orgs are not being ignored quite yet. It's not really pulling the flippers' time and give up on them and and let them go. We're not there at all yet. You know? Sure. And Chris, I would even ask, um, uh, well, first of all, to to agree with what you just said, you see all these efforts to continue opening ideal orgs. Yeah. It, it's getting harder and harder and harder. It's getting slower and slower and slower, but it's still happening. So that means Miscavige is still... Um, putting up this pretense of executing this strategy that's supposed to result in, you know, worldwide expansion of Scientology. So we see that. But I would also say if he were to shift gears um, and pull in the flippers, like I would almost ask, what would that even look like? Would that look like less ethics to people with down stats? W- would you have to start telling people it's okay to have your stats level? Like, how would you even, in the world of Scientology, how would you even execute such a strategy predicated on pulling in the flippers when that's against everything Scientology management stands for in the first place and would acknowledge that Miscavige has failed. How would Miscavige, right. what would that even look like to execute a strategy predicated, like pulling in the flippers? Well, I don't even uh, know what that would look like. Well, I'll tell you straight up, my, one of my first indicators of it, or it was something I would be watching for, would be Sea Org members being pulled out of the orgs and back to the bases to consolidate and centralize, right? Because that's the Sea Org is his core group, right? It's the most loyal, it's the most fanatical. And we don't, and and instead, what we see is the exact opposite of that happening right now, which tells me it's not that situation. That's why I wanted to bring it up. In fact, is because I I don't see him pulling in the flippers and trying to consolidate. I see him shotgunning out, trying to deal with this and that and this and that, 
And in in Scientology, as you and I know from our years in, that's how they operate. It is it is it is not like they have these long term stable plans that they follow ruthlessly. They are they, it is a chaotic mess at at the level of of organizing and managing Scientology. It's not a clean. It's just not anything like you would see in the business world. Let's say. That's right. And I think any examples that we could point to where it looks like class five orgs or maybe certain class five orgs are being sort of ignored or not managed is just that it's getting so much harder. You can't, it, the staffs are getting so much smaller. Yep. Uh, the public inflow is, is getting so much smaller that in order to pay attention to some of these orgs, you sort of have to ignore the other orgs. Exactly. And, you know, to speak to the, the cyclical nature of management styles, you know, uh, it, one month it'll be you, uh, you know, speaking to the staff of an org, you guys are a bunch of assholes. You're not doing your job. So we're going to come in and do it for you. And then the next month it'll be, you guys are a bunch of assholes for thinking we're just going to stay here and do your jobs for you. We're leaving. <laughs> yep. Yeah, right. Yep. So, exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's so whimsical. <laughs> it's so, whim it's, it, it, you know, it's so whimsical. <laughs> right. How dare you expect us to stay here and do your job? Right. We're out of here. You're responsible for this. I mean, and I think the reason, one of the reasons you see this cyclical nature of a management style is because the Scientology management system does not work. No. And so you're always just handling the current emergency and Miscavige is always, and, and management's always having to blow whichever uh, direction Miscavige's uh, wind is going, um, <laughs> blowing with his wind. Right. And he changes his mind all the time. But I think the biggest thing I would point to right now um, uh, as evidence against the pulling in your flippers is that management teams from all the orgs are being sent to flag for the new um, OEC course, which every time the OEC evolution has happened in the past, and it's at least twice, this is supposed to be the new spearhead strategy to expand Scientology greater than That's ever right. before. And, right. and it's like, okay, you're doing another training evolution. Um, That's right. And, you know, someone, someone asked me recently, like, um, cause I was speaking to someone who was fresh out of Scientology and, and they had information about all of these other orgs and how horribly they were doing. And in a conversation I was having, someone said, I, how, how are these orgs in touch with each other? I thought they were like just islands who didn't know what was going on everywhere else. And I, and it occurred to me that, you know, normally that might be true, but every time Miscavige pulls people to flag for these massive international training evolutions, it creates a network where the staff members in all of the orgs practically become family that's right and then they go back to their orgs and all of a sudden there's this international network where everyone's talking to each other and everyone everyone finds out how fucked up everything is at orgs halfway around the world <laughs> that's right it's, it's almost an unintended consequence of miscavige still trying to run everything from flag yep and make sure everyone's on the exact page he wants them to be on but then they all go home and they all stay in touch with each other. So it makes it harder for him to lie to everybody about how things are going internationally. Right. So I, I, I really do feel there's nothing, there's nothing Miscavige could do at this point to sort of reverse the dwindling spiral of Scientology. But he's not going to stop trying because he's not capable. He's not able to stop trying. It's his only way to retain power is to try to maintain this illusion. Everything's working and everything's working wonderfully. And he's responsible for it. You can't, you can't change that equation. He has to keep trying to do that. That's right. Um, or at least and, uh, keep putting out the appearance that that's what he cares about. And that's his mainline activity. Exactly. Yeah. Um, can I tell you a, a quick anecdote on this subject that yeah. combines Clearwater Scientology and that strategy of having to make it look like you're expanding? So, you know, the sandcastle is the one building on the flag land base where the OT levels are delivered. Mm -hmm. Well, the sandcastle is located right next to Coachman Park. Well, Coachman Park, as I mentioned earlier, is, under, is about to undergo a $65 million renovation. And that renovation includes a massive uh, covered outdoor 4,400 seat amphitheater that's going to have concerts like every week. Oh, okay. oh they're going to just be fit to be tied about that. <laughs> well, you're going to love how this, you're going to love how this works out here. So the amphitheater was actually moved all the way to the side of the park closest to the sandcastle, <laughs> making that building impossible to run auditing sessions or solo auditing sessions. Right. Yes. So what, so what they're planning on doing 
just like they did with the Fort Harrison, is reconverting the sandcastle into a pure hotel, not an advanced org. Yep. And they're building a new, or they will be building a new advanced org um, north of the sandcastle, further away from the park, and probably with better soundproofing and everything. And you can see where this is going. This is a strategy they've had to implement to basically even be able to continue delivering OT levels. That's right. And yet they're going to market this as an expansion of the base. They're going to market this as we had to build a new AO because of the unbelievable explosion in growth at the top of the bridge. That's and right. Scientologists are just going to swallow that shit whole. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly so, right. Exactly. They can all <laughs> they almost have the ability to turn anything bad into an opportunity to create this illusion that it's good or that it's expansion. Oh, we had to buy more buildings. No, you just got chased out of your advanced org because that's how little influence you have. Right. On one side of the park, you have a big condo tower full of rich people. On the other side of the park, you have the advanced org of the Church of Scientology. Well, the rich people were able to use their influence to say, we don't want that fucking amphitheater on our side of the park. Get it over there. That's right. <laughs> And Scientology didn't have the influence to be like, this is religious persecution. Like they had no influence to prevent it from happening. So instead, they're going to turn it into a hotel and they're going to build a new advanced org and they're going to, you know, basically mask the fact that they had no influence to prevent this from happening to them. Perfect. Anyway, (laughs) that was the anecdote. It just occurred to me to ask you this. Do you think that the push to get Scientologists to move to Clearwater, which seems an informal sort of you know, thing with the public that they talk to one another or the staff kind of push this, I guess, in some fashion. But it seemed like that was a thing for a while. Um, Is that still a thing? Are they trying to get them there? And do you think they're trying to get them there to try to counter this problem of not having influence? So um, my answer is I don't think that's a thing. I don't think that's happening. I'll tell you why. Okay. Uh, First of all, I think we know um, ever since you and I were on staff and in the Sea Org, um, Every time the flag world tour goes from org to org or every time, you know, an FSC comes to town, there's always some sort of a mild push to move to flag, even if it's under the guise of go from clear to OT7. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, I'm Mm -hmm. moving to clear water. There's always been somewhat of a push to get people to clear water. Mm -hmm. Only it's just because, well, that's where you can truly be a dedicated Scientologist and move up the bridge with no distractions. So we know that's always been there. Yeah. we have seen there's been sort of an exodus from states like New York and California just due to the COVID stuff in general. Yep. Um, but here's here's my real point. I have seen Scientologists moving to Clearwater, but not to Clearwater. Clearwater, uh, what we what you and I call Clearwater is really a collection of towns. Ah, um, okay. Dunedin, Largo, Safety Harbor, Palm Harbor. Um, uh, and, and and the reason I'm mentioning this is because you can only vote in the elections if you oh Bel Air you can only vote in the elections if you actually live in Clearwater oh, and okay. many of these Scientologists who on Facebook are saying they've moved to Clearwater don't live in Clearwater oh. and so if Miscavige was really pushing people to move to Clearwater and instead you move to Bel Air or Largo or Dunedin you'd actually be in a lot of trouble because that's counter intention right. management if. If they're trying to stack the deck for the next election and you move here and you move to somewhere where you can't fucking vote, uh, you've just non-complied with David Miscavige's it, right. uh, intention. Right. So um, that, that's why I'm confident there's no there's no big push to do that. Um, okay. Also, you'd have to take a good chunk of all the Scientologists in the world and get them here in order to even have any hope of having any sort of an impact. Um, and, and it just wouldn't work. It just wouldn't work. And it would really make it more obvious in all of these other fields that there's really not as many Scientologists as there should be. Like like trying to bring everyone to Clearwater would be a little counterproductive for uh, Miscavige, I think, actually. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So those those are my thoughts. No, fair enough. I get that. I'll say on top of that, that the thing that occurs to me is if I were in charge of this and if I were like on Scientology's part, if I was in charge of or given charge of uh, dealing with the Clearwater, you know, voting problem or something, 
Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm quite positive that conversations like this have happened in OSA, whether, you know, they've done anything about it is another mob problem. But, you know, you, Mark Bunker, I mean, you guys are, are absolutely thorns in their sides. No question about it. They hate you guys. And they would love to do something about getting you out of their hair. So I would be working on establishing community amongst all the Scientologists who are there. But here's the problem, is that even that can't happen, because in Scientology, you can't really create community because there's this little thing called trust, and Scientologists don't really trust one another. It's a snitch culture, and, it, and that's always there. Uh, the, the DeWalls talked about this. I mean, Sylvia was there. Tim were there, right? We talked about this in some detail about how the Scientologists in the community, they, they, they watch each other. They're, they're snitching on each other all the time. You cannot create community in, the, in that kind of environment, in that kind of culture, yeah. you know? So, so I, I, bring, I only bring that up because it's not really talked about very often in relation to Clearwater, but it's an important point. This, the Scientologists in Clearwater aren't even a united body because they're, they're, they're not united because in Scientology you can't be because you have because of the snitching thing, you know, the confession culture. So anyway, I just wanted to make that point on top of yours. No, it, it's true. And, you know, you also you have that dynamic um, – just person to person within the normal Scientology community. Yep. And then it gets compounded when you have this caste system of Sea Org members, staff members, and public, yep. and they're all trying to snitch on down the ladder. Right. And then in, in the normal community of Scientologists, you have the mixture, you have those staff members mixed in with the public. Yep. And the staff members are always trying to be the ones to be, you know, uh, have ethics presence with the public yep. and trying to keep everyone... And everyone's just pressuring each other. I mean, it's, it's just not a good scene. And and when you talk about creating community, I, I, were you referring more of just the Scientologists or trying to get them to also create community with the non-Scientologists? Well, the, the, the first phase would be the Scientologists themselves. And then the next phase would be intermingling with the, you know, with the WOGs, with the non-Scientology public and generating, you know, the goodwill and the PR area control. I mean, this is how it's supposed to work. And the only yeah. people who are really any good at it are are a couple people in OSA. Yeah, you know? exactly. And even then, it's like it's really interesting to speak, you know, privately with non Scientologists who Scientology thinks are safe pointed, right? right? <laughs> and and to get their real thoughts of yep. like, yeah, they're really weird and uh, like creepy and like slimy, and they're always. Uh, doing like they're not trusted like scientology uh, you know osa the pat harney's the lisa mansells of 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 clearwater really do think that they have people safe pointed in the community um and they really don't yeah um and and again that's one of the things i'm hoping to make very very obvious when i have the platform to do so <laughs> yes exactly well i can speak to this as well from my own experience of having been out and about across the west us recovering scientologists for so many years and how i thought in my diluted sea org you know cuz the same thing cast system sea org i come in i come rolling into town i'm the guy in the uniform everybody has to yes sir no sir how high sir that's that's the etiquette right that's just the culture so I'm thinking as a Sea Org member, oh, I'm the friendly Sea Org member. I'm the guy everybody likes, you know, and I recover people and I'm a happy Sea Org member. And yeah. this is what I was telling. This was the narrative I was telling myself, right? And I can look back now from my, from my perspective, which is a hell of a lot more objective than it was then, and see I intimidated people. I threatened people. I scared people. I frightened them into compliance all the time. I was not a nice guy. But I was telling myself I was a nice guy because compared to other Sea Org members, I kind of was, <laughs> you know, which is horrible because uh, it really speaks to the depths of the of the depravity of it. I mean, it's really the power disparities are are unbelievable. They're very hard to describe if, unless you live it. Yeah. But, but I really came out of Scientology and for a number of years, I thought I was the good Sea Org guy. You know, and yeah. no, that's that 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 really doesn't exist. That was me lying to myself. There is no such yeah. thing as a good Sea Org member. That 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 just doesn't really work out. You know, it's so. true. It's true. And um, you know, the things they try to do in the community, like like I'm one of the directors of my neighborhood association, mm -hmm. and the president of that association is a good friend of mine. And 
She is someone who's very well known in the community. She's lived here forever. Like she knows everybody. And um, Pat Harney requested a meeting with her. Oh, I, and so my, my friend called me. I'm like, why is, why is the church, why is Pat asking to meet with me? Is there something going on? And I'm like, well, it just so happened. <laughs> this was around the time the Cult City Tours thing was going ah. on. And, and, and I'd started talking about running for city council publicly already. And, and I said, oh, she's calling you in to tell you about the Cult City Tours and to tell you about what a giant bigot I am and how could, uh, oh, it would be horrible if someone like this ran for city council. And she goes, she better not, that better not be why she's calling me in because I'll get up and walk out. So she goes to the meeting and, uh, and that's exactly, that's exactly what it was. <laughs> you nailed it. <laughs> and, and then Pat, Pat says to uh, my friend, um, you know, Aaron was expelled from Scientology for bullying people. <laughs> This is when I put up a tweet that I yep. you saw yep. that was like, Scientology's trying to tell people in my community I got kicked out for bullying people. You can't get kicked out for raping people. Exactly. You can't you can't get kicked out for molesting kids. That's right. You can't get kicked out for running a billion dollar Ponzi scheme. Mm -hmm. You can't get kicked out for defrauding Medicare of tens of millions of dollars. But they want to be like Aaron bullied people. Like, <laughs> he was mean. Aaron was mean to people. <laughs> and can you, could, what do you think he, Aaron might run for city council. And my friend goes, yeah, I heard that he might. And, and Pat goes, it's not a rumor. It's true. <laughs> like she thinks people are going to be more afraid of Aaron the bully than the church of Scientology you know, trying to take over Clearwater exactly. in their clumsy way that they attempt to do it. So right. it's almost like, you know what I've started to try to explain to people, Chris, is like, if you know a little bit about Scientology, you're probably going to be afraid of it. Mm -hmm. The more and more you actually know about Scientology, yep. the less afraid of it you're going to be. Yep. Because on the surface level, they're able to get into your head. You hear fantastic things, you know, all, they're true, of course, but, you know, it, it instills fear and mystery and the unknown. That's right. And the more you truly understand it, the more you go, oh, it's just a bunch of bullshit. They're totally unorganized. There's like the Keystone cops. Yes, they can try to do things with their money to fuck with you, but it only works if you don't understand what they're trying to do and why and the limits of how it's just so ineffective. Exactly. It's just so ineffective. Exactly. Um, and I guess it's that. Um, it's that main, it's, I guess it's kind of, uh, that's my main thrust of like, there's a lot of people in Clearwater who have that surface understanding and therefore have a, a degree of fear. Yep. I want to try to give as many people in Clearwater as possible the deeper understanding so they can understand, no, 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 no. It's almost like a snake. They're actually more afraid of you than you should be of it. Yep. Um, and I'm sort of hoping that the more people, the people of Clearwater understand that, the more um, they will just come back downtown. It's almost like people talk about taking back downtown and you go, do you know how to take it back? Take it back. Nothing's preventing you from taking it back right now other than um, not fully understanding that you can. You really could just go take it back. So um, it'll be hard. It'll be a challenge to communicate all of these things to as many people as possible over a six month period. Uh, but I, I'm really hoping, and I really do believe it's something that the people of Clearwater will uh, support in a big way. Awesome. Well, I, I certainly hope so too. And I, I wanted to say, to build on to what you just said, that it is, you know, somebody could watch my channel and of course there's, you know, tons of stuff to watch there and they could watch yours and they could, you know, check out Tony's blog and stuff. And they get that we talk about this group as an authoritarian high control group, because that is internally what it is. They're, the, the membership is, is, is horribly abused. You were abused. I was abused. We are trauma survivors. That all being said, what we're trying to differentiate here, I think, and I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what I think we're trying to differentiate is that they are a threat to the people inside way more than they are a threat to the people outside. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. Because someone could hear the message I just said and go, wait, you're saying the more you understand about them, the less afraid of them. Like, are you saying they're good? No, 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 right. no, no. Exactly. Don't be afraid of them. 
you are more powerful against them than they are against you. Right. Yeah. By, by all means, if your family member is about to join Scientology, you have something to worry about. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and we need to be clear you know? about these things because people can do interesting things with our words, you know. So I so I take great pains to clarify these things because I want people to get that yeah, it is a dangerous destructive group and you don't want to have anything to do with it. On the other hand, don't let this little pipsqueak operation run by a pissant sociopath just, you know, keep you from living your life, doing what you want to do. And if you want to move to Clearwater or you want to move to Florida, do it. You know, it's nothing that's right. about that that should scare you. And that's the thing that's that right. to say. That's right. There's so many people who ask me in various contexts, people who've never had anything to do with Scientology. Um, am I in any danger? Um, is my life in danger? Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what I mean when I'm like, oh, boy. Uh, you have to have a very superficial introduction to the world of Scientology to think they have that much power exactly. that they could actually be a literal danger to you. And then I have to sort of correct myself and go, well, look, do they try to mess with me and my life and my friends and my business? Yes. Should that bother me? No. Right. They're very bad at it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, and just to and not to put too fine a point on it or 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 pump myself up because I, I, you know, because I, I don't really need an excuse to do that anyway. But uh, I have not I, I'm not even on the stand league page. I mean, you know, I, I am not an ineffective what? critic. Yeah, I have. I have personally that... kept people out of Scientology, gotten people out of it, etc. I am a direct threat to the church. I'm not even on their Stan League page. Hmm. I wow. find that fascinating. You know, you should write a strongly worded letter. <laughs> right. <to the> <laughs> well, just to speak to inefficiencies, just to speak to how ineffective they are. You know, these are people who don't have anything else to do all day, but work about. You know, work against us. You know, work against you, me, Mike, Leah, and clearly their time is dedicated to you know their legal cases and Mike and Leah a hell of a lot more than they're worried about you and me. Um, but it's just interesting how, you know, I'm just, I'm really just trying to reinforce what you said about how inefficient and unorganized they are. You know, it really yeah. is because there's so few of them. People really don't understand how few of them there are. And in the yeah. entire time I have done this from the first day that I, that I put my first video out or, or wrote my first anonymous thing on Mike's blog, I have never once thought that they, that I f should fear for my life. In my wildest yeah. fantasies of what Scientology could do to me, and and I've had some pretty wild, you know, ideas about how they could come after me, um, and they certainly have the resources to do it. I never imagined that they would try to kill me, you know, or anybody no. I'm connected with. That's just never even entered my headspace. So, yeah, those That's are funny right. questions. Those are very funny questions to get. Yeah, isn't it interesting, Chris, to see the length Scientology will go to? to harass somebody and um, and how much money they will spend when it, it would be so much cheaper and easier to just have them killed. <laughs> right? I mean, I, <laughs> right? Yes. Look at everything they did to Paulette Cooper. Are you kidding? It would have been so much easier to kill her. That's right. Like, uh, That's right. I, I mean, I mean, it sounds twisted, but it's true. Yeah. That's like, right. And, and then there's that story that gets told. I, I don't say stories if it's not true. It's just the anecdote of like, her roommate having been infiltrated her life, who was a Scientologist and they were up on top of a building and they were drinking and she was standing on the ledge. This story gets told as if it's, um, oh my God, uh, they could have had her killed. And I go, yeah. And it would have been so easy to do it right there. Yep. But they didn't, right? They'd that's rather, right. It's, it, it, I've always wondered like, is it just that Miss, that's a line Miscavige isn't willing to cross or does he take more pleasure in just being able to fuck with somebody for 20 or 30 years? I don't know the answer. I would, I would say think it's that the Miscavige latter. would be willing to have someone. You think it's the latter? I think it's the <laughs> latter. Yes. And the reason why yeah. is because I, to this day, and just, just between us, you know, us, us girls, I, I really still to this day wonder about Shelly's mom. Okay, I, I really do wonder about that one. But that was so close to David. That was like a family, literally, right? So yeah. I've always wondered, that's the only one I've ever really wondered about. 
you know, yeah. uh, the, 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 the judge's dog, too, right, getting killed. I think that was a thing. But that that was probably a private investigator executing that. That wasn't even a Scientologist doing that, you know? So, yeah, I mean, even when Marty was, before he went, uh, you know, uh, back, I, like, I, I have asked Marty and Mike directly, like, okay, what's the deal with the dog stuff? Yeah. And they're like, you know, that's just not something we would have ever ordered or asked for. Like, if really? someone did that... It, yeah, if someone did that, it, it was just like someone deciding they were going to like go overboard and be an asshole. Like that's not that's not something that was done. That wasn't part of a thing. Interesting. And I I I, I believe that. I mean, okay. right, fair I believe enough. that. Like, I mean, coincidences happen, so I can't say absolutely positively it was Scientology who killed that judge's dog. I mean, you can't, right. you know, and if you can't do that, you do have to recognize that your claim is on shaky ground, and you got to at least acknowledge that. Yeah, because so, you know enough, if it had been, you know. you know, it would be it would be a piece of cake for Mike to be like, "Oh yeah, Miscavige loves the dog thing." Yeah, you know, exactly, you know? <laughs> exactly. And, and and Mike would know. Yes, and it it's not like he hasn't acknowledged worse. <laughs> right. It, yeah. Exactly. See, here's the problem: is we start talking about this stuff and we start sounding like Scientology apologists, you know. So I just so yeah. so we got to be a little careful with that, but it's because um, we're certainly not that, but we're really trying to just bring the, the 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 boundaries of how we talk about this into a more realistic band. I think is what we're really trying to do here. We're yeah. not trying to I mean, say my, there's my back in. my backyard neighbor's a Scientologist. If someone wanted to poison my dog, he'd be dead. Boom! There you go. Exactly. It's you not. Know. Yeah, it's not quite like that. Nor would I, as a Sea Org member ever have poisoned a dog in my most fanatical yeah. moments i would not have done that i i have said out loud and i do believe i would have taken a bullet for miscavige um i would have taken a bullet for hubbard absolutely like no question about it um and i would have engaged in physical violence for scientology i would have done that um I don't know that I would have killed some innocent creature for Scientology. I don't think I could see myself doing that in my wildest times of, of fanaticism there, you know? And so I, and just speaking to your back door, really what I was responding to was your, your next door neighbor. You know, they're, they're not, it, it's not a case that every Scientologist is fully violently radicalized. That's not really the picture with Scientology. So, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, okay. But there are changes happening as a result of what we're doing. And I did want to talk about that because you, um, from your position, do happen to be in a place where you have inside skinny. And, you know, I've kind of, I, I don't really even ever have tried to build those bridges to find out what the hell's still going on in Scientology. I gave up on that years ago as, frankly, kind of not interesting. But these updates are kind of interesting. So <laughs> if we could talk a little yeah. bit about that. Well, I, I, um, <clears throat> I can't even say that I've put effort into trying to uh, maintain or build those bridges either, but we end up getting things like getting information from sources because of the aftermath foundation. Yep. Um, and because of people leaving, uh, ideal orgs, people leaving sea org orgs. Um, and I don't know a few things if, if uh, uh, one interesting thing that I don't even think we talked off camera was, uh, you know, we had heard of, uh, I had heard a while back of them, uh, implementing Wi-Fi at the pack base on L run Hubbard way for the staff, for the Sea Org members. Yep. And at first I was like, what the fuck? Um, why the fuck would they put in Wi-Fi? Like, and first of all, even if you put in Wi-Fi, that doesn't allow more people to have access to the internet because nobody has devices. <laughs> and so what I found out is that the reason Wi-Fi was implemented was as part of a solution to the flap that it was becoming more and more of a problem of Sea Org members uh, being completely out of touch with their families. And so then I asked, okay, but they didn't all just get devices. Well, there's there's rules against not having cell phones, but there's not rules against having, for example, an iPod, right? Like when I was in this year, I had an iPod. Now, yep. uh, there were earlier versions of iPods that don't have the same capability that they have today. Yep. But today, an iPod is basically an iPhone. You can download any app like Facebook Messenger or whatever, Oh, or and you know anything else like yep. uh, WeChat, Signal, WhatsApp. Yep. And it's immediately like a phone. Um, and this speaks to sort of the um, the rigidity of Sea Org rules and people people's inability to think with them. Despite the fact that there's rules against having phones in the Sea Org, you're allowed to have an iPad or an iPod. And so 
people were using their devices to stay in touch with their families. But but then they basically all had access to the internet now. So this is kind of this is you know over the last two years this has really started to backfire. Uh, people watching Netflix, people watching YouTube and stuff mm-hmm. like that, um, sort of gives them a taste of the outside world. We've been hearing about, hearing about this for a couple of years, um, and uh, and um, I thought that, I think there was another add-on point I was trying to make to that, uh, but I I totally well, you were, forgot. You were talking um, about um, staying in touch with their families. Now yeah. they've got internet so, access. Yeah, that's right. And they're being a little more permissive with Sea Org members having phones. But it has to be an Android phone. It can't be an iPhone. Um, and uh, Chris Owen gave a, a great explanation for that. He said, well, Android phones, you can sideload software into an Android phone that allows you to monitor all of the activity That's on the right. phone. That's I mean, right. I, I believe even down to the keystroke level. Yep. Um, so... And so that's a way where you, you the Seerg member feels like they have freedom, but you can still completely monitor what they're doing. That's right. Um, and... Uh, and so, what was what was some of the other stuff that we spoke about? Uh, well, it was it was um, screen. It, there are also oh. the cleanup that's being done. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah. um, there's been a lot of stuff published on Mike's blog and Tony's blog about the financial irregularities that have occurred. Yep. In and other um, words, in other words, that's what Scientology calls it internally. What we call it in the real world is credit card fraud, extortion, things like that. <laughs> And, and wire fraud, yeah. Right. So you get a public's information. It, uh, anyone who's been in Scientology for a long time knows that a registrar will sit down with a public who they're trying to get a large donation from. The public will say, oh, I don't have enough credit um, cards. I don't have enough availability. Uh, the reg can get the public to give them all of their information, social security number, everything that they need. And the reg will go and open up a bunch of credit cards That's right. in their name. And then basically max them out. That's right. Well, as Scientology started to dwindle, and it's dwindling at the same time that Miscavige is trying to build all these giant orgs, um, it's created a real problem financially. And the stress of how to make this money has caused the registrars to go more unusual and unusual, um, i.e. illegal, illegal, of opening up credit cards in people's names without their permission. And then maxing them out. That's right. And now you create a problem where, well, this Scientologist, uh, based on internal policy, is prohibited from seeking any uh, relief from the actual authorities. Yep. Um, and yet, this is credit card fraud. And this has gotten so bad that the Sea Org has been sending in missions to various orgs, um, heavy, heavy ethics missions, class nine auditors to sec check all of the execs. Um, removing the executives, um, going through all the treasury files. And this is where it gets really incredible. Creating, setting up a legal fund um, from S, uh, funded by SO reserves to a uh, CORG reserves to actually pay back the public who had the credit cards opened up, like actually issuing refunds proactively to prevent um, the legal fallout from having committed the credit card fraud. And between you and me, I mean, look, I'm no legal expert. I'm no scholar. I'm no lawyer. The fallout could be as 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 um, as big as eventually losing their tax exemption. Yep, that's right. right. That's I exactly mean, the, the problem. That's right. Um, committing credit card fraud and wire fraud. These are federal crimes. Yep. And it's widespread. And the church knows it's widespread. And they know... Like at the end of the day, Miscavige is it. There's one thing Miscavige is interested in more than making money. That's protecting the tax exempt status. Yep. So once, um, and by the way, this whole practice from what we've heard from various people started after LA org turned into a C org org. And they brought in registrars from orgs all over the world where ideal orgs were opening to train under the C org registrar at LA org. That's right. And this son of, and this son of a bitch trained all of these regs at the ideal orgs on how to commit this credit card fraud. Yep. And, the, <laughs> and, and you can, and this is a huge threat to the, to the tax exempt status of the church. And me saying this on the video, doesn't like let the cat out of the bag. The church knows it's a threat, yep. which is why they're trying to do damage control. And the thing is, 
Giving everybody their money back doesn't get you off the hook for having committed the credit card fraud in the first place. In fact, it acknowledges you knew about it. Exactly. Exactly. And I'm not saying and I'm not saying it would have been better if they didn't give everybody their money back. I'm just saying they're trying to cover up something, but the cover up is going to make it more obvious that they knew about all this shit. Exactly. Do do they are they getting people to sign, you know, NDA lights or something like that for, you know, when they get their money back? Oh, I, I don't have the, uh, the I don't have that level of detail. No, fair enough. I just um, thought I'd throw it out there because I'm yeah, pretty sure they're going to do something like that. You know, we'll give you this money, you, but you have to sign on the dotted line, right? You'd have to think so. It, it's just that um, no NDA can prevent someone from cooperating with the authorities. Oh, true enough. Um, true enough. You know? Yeah. Um, but at least it would just, stop them from uh, overtly going and, you know. No, 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 oh, no. Oh, no? An NDA, an NDA cannot prevent you from proactively going to the authorities like oh, okay. you cannot prevent someone from disclosing a crime okay got it got it okay, um it, you can, it can prevent you from maybe like speaking to the press um well, well there's certainly there are prevent. certainly a lot of ndas out there that seem to effectively shut people up from talking about criminal activities but well that's true yeah and, but also let's take angie blankenship for an just as an example let's sure. say she has an nda to keep her mouth shut um she even if she knew let's assume she does know that that NDA doesn't prevent her from going to the authorities. If she did go to the authorities, the church would have stopped giving her money. Right. Uh, That's right. You, That's right. And also, the, one of the purposes of those NDAs is to give people the impression that maybe they're not allowed to go to the authorities. And that's my you point. Know? It's a psychological op as much as it is a legal op, you know? Exactly. That's exactly. My, yeah, that's where I was going with that. But please continue. Yeah. And so those financial irregularities are... Um, you know, it's it's not just at orgs. It's with you know Sea Org members, um, Sea Org members who are at the end of their lives, yep. um, who once they die, their unsecured credit will be erased, their unsecured debt will be uh, erased. Um, and the thing is, Scientology knows that these things are known about outside of Scientology. So on the one hand, I guess it's positive. If, uh, you know, the public exposure of this information or the fact that they know people know prevents them from continuing to do it. That's a positive. Yep. Right. Yep. Um, we mentioned earlier about the RPF. The RPF has developed so much bad PR for Scientology that at first they just sort of um, stopped assigning people to the RPF and they let everybody graduate. Mm -hmm. And then when they weren't graduating fast enough, they sort of accelerated the graduation process or lowered the requirements or whatever. And now they've simply, they don't assign people to the RPF anymore. Yeah. Right? Yep. And that's a good thing. That's right. Uh, it, it's not because they changed their mind about it. It's because it, it's a cover your ass thing. And you go, okay, that's positive. That's you know, right. People are no longer going to be subject to the horror that was the RPF. Um, and so, I don't know, all these things sort of combine together into a giant soup of... Uh, Scientology gradually diminishing in size, uh, in influence, in membership, um, gradually being forced to treat uh, their people a bit better. Um, and uh, I don't know, that's another thing. This is another area where people uh, might have different interpretations of uh, what's good or what's bad. Like mm -hmm. I've seen some people re respond to information like this and go, well, this is actually bad because if they treat people better, people will be more likely to stay. Um, and it's hard for me to have a strong opinion about that one way or the other. I'm even if, even, you know what I mean? Like oh, I say, do. So people I in do. Scientology maybe start getting treated a bit better. So they're more likely to stay. I'm like, well, I don't really give a shit if someone wants to believe in Scientology. I don't really care. Yep. What I care about is families being destroyed. What I care about is people being bankrupted. What I care about is that, um, emotional terrorism that they, enact upon their members that's right you know that's right so scientology sort of reaches this equilibrium where they sort of treat everyone good enough to keep who they have i kind of go i don't care they'll still lose their tax exempt status and they'll they'll still get inundated with lawsuits after that and yeah you know well it's the it's I, the, it's what i call the mainstreaming of a cult right and it's it's sort of a microcosm of that i mean it's cover your ass is what it actually is you've correctly labeled it that's a thousand percent what they're doing.
However, there's a PR spin you can put on this of, oh, this is Scientology 2.0. This is Scientology kinder, gentler. This is the better Scientology. This is how it really should have been all along. Well, no, that's just PR because you still have OSA, you still have shunning and disconnection, you still have the emotional blackmail and the cans and the um, uh, confession culture, right? Which is psychological blackmail, and all of those elements are still there, as well as the authoritarian control system and caste system. So, so it's all just PR that this is spinning in a positive direction. Yet at the same time, it's a real world reality that I will absolutely attest to that thank fucking God the RPF doesn't exist anymore because I can't imagine something worse for somebody to experience than what I went through for three years. So absolutely, you know, good. Thank you. <laughs> but let's not pretend that this is anything more than covering your ass. It's not Scientology. It's not a reform. It's not a reformation. It's not a David Miscavige has suddenly realized that there's a kinder side he should exhibit or demonstrate. None, none of that is part of this picture. And as long as That's we're right. clear about that, I think we're talking honestly about it. That's right. And what's interesting about these changes that they're making is they're not even changes they can try to toot their own horn about because if they do, they have to acknowledge there was something wrong in the first place <laughs> exactly. and they never do. That's right. That's right. Which right? is why it's just going to be relentless spin instead yeah. of like acknowledging, for, <laughs> you know. Any time the church has had to defend the RPF or the concept of the RPF in a court of law, they always refer to it as being either voluntary or based on scripture and all this other kind of stuff. Yep. So then how in the hell would Miscavige explain getting rid of it? Exactly. <laughs> He's got five papers from academics apologizing for it. He's got apologetics yeah. on the RPF. I mean, I think there's about three or four or five papers on that that they paid good yeah. money to have produced. You know, yeah. you know, the, these the are guys been say, it, go ahead. for 40 years. He's been <laughs> saying that every word L. Ron Hubbard has ever written has been reviewed and verified against the originals and after completely unsourced. And it's like and and like you said, they've commissioned all these studies to defend the RPF. And it's like. Then why did you get rid of it? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So they. They can't even publicly say, we've made a change, we've done this. It's something they just they just tell people internally. Oh yeah, no, we've gotten rid of that. It was uh it was it was reviewed, it was off source. Yep. And uh because of the brainwashing, I don't like the word, but the conditioning, people go, Oh yeah, that makes sense. You know, I I owe that and I'm so glad you changed it now. It, it, the cognitive dissonance within Scientology allows Miscavige to get away with Boom. little with explanations. That's like right. That. That's exactly right. Um to the world at large, it wouldn't work, but the world at large isn't paying attention. Exactly. And I think that's probably why. Well, here's the thing. Um, for those who are paying attention or for those who know something about it now, even a little bit, having watched Aftermath or Going Clear or something like that, and written it off as an authoritarian destructive cult, right, which is, which is what it is, you, you could, if, if it wasn't what it is, then they would fess up to their mistakes and they would they would say we screwed up this was wrong they could even use the few bad apples arguments and probably even get away with it because people are pretty silly that way but they don't even try to do that much because the cult mindset one for one for one across the boards whether it's scientology or anybody else when you get to the level of the policymaking leadership level, this is a level where you cannot ever admit error. It's just the nature of the beast that they, they, they can't go there. The second you yeah. start admitting error is the second you actually stop being such a destructive cult because you're capable of reflection and change. And that's not totally. what that mindset's about. So that's the push pull of this that makes it so frustrating and fascinating at the same time you know totally yeah. totally you know there's one other aspect um uh, i've done some videos and spoken publicly about and and when i've done these videos it was, it was really for the benefit of local clearwater people to understand how flag engages in human trafficking mm. um and it's it, it's not sex trafficking it's not you right. know it's not child it's labor trafficking. trafficking yeah yeah you know bringing in people from Russia and South America on religious visas, uh, you get somebody to pay for their plane ticket. In other words, they couldn't even afford to come. They get here, uh, you take their passports and their visas, 
you're only paying them $50 a week. Yep. So now that they're here, not only can they not afford to leave if they wanted to, but they don't have their travel documents to leave. Um, so I've, I've discussed that publicly. Well, they've, that's, this is another example where they've, they've stopped taking people's passports because they've acknowledged it's illegal. Right. But they can't publicly say they've stopped doing it because that would admit they were doing it before. Right. That's right. right. That's exactly right. It's like the kids in school. They, you know, OSA came down like a ton of bricks on on all the miners on the base going to school because they have to go to school. It's a legal requirement. They started coming down on this, right? This is back in like 2008 or nine or something. And, um, and suddenly it was a thing. The schedules got changed. All the cadets had to now be on this new schedule. And it was to comply with the law. Well, the only reason for that is because so many of those cadets had left the Sea Org and spoken out about the abusive, harsh conditions and how they'd been raised with no education, no real, even parents, no parenting was really going on. And it was a disastrous mess. And OSA was left to clean that mess up because they never bothered to enforce legal standards in the first place. If they had done their job right. in the first place, none of that would have happened, you know? So that's right. <clears throat> So let me tell you a funny little story here that uh, how even though they're trying to comply with the law to cover their asses at the at, at their core, they cannot help but um, to continue to act the way they really want to act. So here's the, here's the answer. <laughs> so there was this Russian young Russian guy who left the surrogate flag and I was talking to him and he goes, uh, he goes, you know, because I, I asked him about the passport thing. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, yeah, we had to turn on our passports to X, Y and Z. And then he goes, but you know what? Then, then at some point, my passport was routed back to me in the comm system without any explanation or for why it was being sent back to me. And I didn't want to ask. I just held on to the passport. But then when I said I wanted to route out, the senior HCO person came to me and said, oh, yeah, you need to, you need to turn over your passport. Right. That's <laughs> right. There it is. There it is. And, but here's the thing. That's even worse. Like... It's one thing if Scientology wants to say, we've got a policy to protect the travel documents of everybody within our care, and all the documents are kept right here so that anytime somebody wants them, we know exactly where it is. That explanation may not work, but at least it sounds possibly genuine to someone who doesn't know what they're talking about. Yep. But to then go, no, once somebody says they want to leave, we confiscate <laughs> their travel documents. Right. It's even... Work. Right, exactly. <laughs> they can't really do it honestly because the bottom line is it's not really an honest organization. And we, right. and and that's the part that we need to stress I think more than anything is that when you hear about reforms, when you hear about things going on in the church that are improvements, uh, okay, great. But take it with a grain of salt and always suspect the motivation. Because it's not necessarily the motivation you're going to assume if you're thinking that this is a pro-human rights organization. They're not. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So talking about motivations, should we chat about COVID a little bit? In the world yes, of please. Because it seems to me that COVID was Thor's hammer on Miscavige's head in terms of expanding Scientology. I mean, they just had to shut down for the last year. Yeah. The COVID thing is such a weird one when it comes to the Church of Scientology because it shows a degree of schizophrenia that's even hard for me to explain and completely understand, right? Oh my God, so yes, at first, yes. <laughs> yes I mean, we already know that Scientologists as a whole um, buy into almost any conspiracy theory that has to do with world control and domination. Yep, that's right. And and in the beginning, the, the flag land base was not taking COVID and COVID regulations very seriously. And they got embarrassed in the local media for that. Yep. Then they went completely to the other end of the pendulum swing. Yep. Um, and like literally like locked everything down. Now you would still see some, some activity at the flag land base, but I'm talking about, um, well, you know, they publicly did this campaign of like what, uh, trying to disinfect and decontaminate, uh, uh, going around to businesses and decontaminating them. Like now we're the, the superheroes of the coronavirus <laughs> That's you right. know, thing. That's right. And that was weird. That was weird, but we could still understand that from, uh, you know, that still looks pretty similar to going to a disaster zone and acting like you're helping. We could understand that behavior. Yep. 
uh, I would have still assumed it was theater, right? Yep. Um, but then COVID was spreading around the base, like the student, the student motels up on North Fort Harrison, the Clipper, the Mariner and the trade wind. That was their quarantine zone for anyone that got COVID. Mm. Um, so COVID was spreading. And I do believe that um, <sighs> Scientology straddles this fence of saying not really believing in the germ theory of disease, but still at the same time, recognizing that disease does spread. Yep. Right. So this people can get confused about what Scientology really thinks about disease and illness. Like, like people who work for David Miscavige do get the flu shot. Like mm -hmm. if you didn't believe in sickness or illness, you wouldn't get the flu shot. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's a little schizophrenic uh, way that Scientology acts towards illness and, and disease. Right. Okay. Because, so, because also you'll filter this down to the public and the, and there are tons of Scientology public who are anti-vax won't get the vaccine. Absolutely. Right. So it's not a 100%. Uh, and, and this is the thing we're talking about is this it's it's weird. It's bizarro world in Scientology with this. Well, that's right. And then there's a huge segment of Scientologists who believe this is all, you know, an orchestrated scam by the globalists to to, to do population control and all that stuff. Yep. There's a ton of Scientologists who believe that. And then you still have to ask, like, well, wait a second. Does that imply the disease is real or it's not like if you're saying it's a plan for population control, then are you saying it is killing people or are you saying it's all a Scam, it's not really killing people. Like, where are you coming down on this? That's right. Are you saying the disease is real or not? And let's be honest, not all Scientologists believe the same thing. That's right. Um, but where it's landed now is we're in, I'm in Florida. You're not even allowed to make people wear masks anymore in Florida. There's no capacity requirements at any places of business. Everything's 100% capacity, no masks. And yet, Sea Org members still have to walk around with gloves. I mean, that wasn't even a thing in Florida, plastic gloves and masks. So, you know, the other day, what was, uh, it was Memorial day. There was a, an event the city was putting on, um, Pat Harney was there and everyone at this event is no masks, no nothing. And Pat Harney is there with freaking gloves and a mask. And so Scientology has gone from sort of being a denialist about this whole thing to now looking looking a little ridiculous at this point for trying to take it more seriously than anyone else. Like it's almost like this big virtue signaling. Yep. But again, on some level, I have to go, yeah, but how paranoid do you think Miscavige, I have to imagine that Miscavige would actually be quite paranoid if COVID just swept through the seer bases and just like killed a third of the elderly people. Absolutely. Like that would be terrible. Yes. Right. Yes. And so again, I keep referring to the schizophrenic nature of at this point, I think public Scientologists are probably not necessarily in line with even Miscavige at this point That's on right. COVID. That's right. It's a little hard to say. Yes. This is, this is a little bit like if, if I dare draw this analogy, shit, I don't even know if I should, cause it's so controversial. Actually, you know what? I'm not going to, I'm not actually going to go there. Please continue. I'm not even going to go there. So, so in orgs, remember we mentioned these missions that are being sent in to handle financial irregularities and stuff. Yep. I've heard that in, um, I've heard from people, you know, who were on site that um, even in orgs where Sea Org members were assigned to, they, they, they were like, you're not going into the org for like one month, two months, three months. Like even Sea Org members who were there to help the org were in, you know, lockdown mode. Wow. Like these orgs were literally closed, right. literally for months. <laughs> and um, that doesn't really jive with this idea that Scientologists don't believe in COVID. Yeah. At least Miscavige seems to be terrified of COVID. Well, I think um, that's the case is I, cause he's a pretty paranoid little guy. And I think that you, I think the point you made though, was the actual key to this, which is there are a number of senior citizens who are Sea Org members. And, and by that, I mean like over, you know, 40, 50, whatever. I mean, he's senior people, not, not, 70s and 80s there's a lot of old people in scientology in other words and they are in the target demographic you could say for covid to kill you quick you know and that's a physical universe reality that is undeniable when you have 600,000 deaths across the country you got to acknowledge that this thing kills you so it does and, and the balancing act is exactly this problem of well, we've got all these conspiracy beliefs that this isn't true, but then there's the reality of it. And he has to play the balancer on that. That's right. And, you know, there was, um, 
There was some network, but I think it was an IG network bulletin that Miscavige put out referring to COVID as a planetary bull bait. And I think a lot of people, um, well, I know some people interpreted that to mean fake. Yep. And that's not what bull bait means. That's right. Bull, bull bait would be anything that's actively trying to interfere with you accomplishing what you're trying to accomplish. It doesn't mean fake. It, it, it's real. That's right. And so, you know, uh, COVID creating a, a situation where the economy was shut down, people couldn't travel, people couldn't go into the orcs, people couldn't congregate. You can acknowledge the reality of COVID and still refer to it as a as a planetary bull bait. That's right. Um, and it just does tickle me a little bit to imagine, uh, to think of all the Scientologists that think it is a, a hoax, and then you have Miscavige shutting everything down. And, and then to think that, like, you have to wonder, is, is that creating any cognitive dissonance a, among the people themselves? Probably not, because that's the way it works. <laughs> well, it's no, I think it does generate that noise. And I do, I actually do think that does happen. And they probably have had be, be both. There's so many factors. I mean, no more events, right, for a year. Um, you know, so the retention techniques, in other words, of Scientology have been disrupted over this last year. Then you add on top of that this COVID conspiracy nonsense. And I think this is something that has never really had to that David Miscavige has never really had to deal with before. There's never been a real world circumstance that was this much a departure from the reality of Scientology thinking as COVID and, and the conspiracy theories that Hubbard was kind of fomenting from all the way back to the 60s. One world government, you know, trilateral commission, Rockefeller's, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Hubbard's fully on board with all of that. So if you go with the Bill Gates is engaged in population control conspiracy thinking, and that leads you, by the way, pretty directly to QAnon. And there are absolutely Scientologists who are in the QAnon camp. They're that far gone. David Miscavige has an official, you know, the, 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 the official Church of Scientology position on this is clearly that it's a real disease and that we need to protect people against it. So he chose that as the official position of the church. That's what's promoted. So there's no way this hasn't messed with Scientologists' heads in some fashion, you know, because of this. And that's the very definition of cognitive dissonance. And I think that that probably has been settled in a number of different ways, depending on which Scientologist you talk to, you know. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. I think that's how it's probably worked. And I'm sure they've lost members because of it. Because if there is one thing you can say about QAnon is it is a much more powerful conspiracy theory than the Scientology belief set. Yeah. yeah, I've, I've, um, I guess I've never, uh, well, I've been wondering how the political upheaval or division over mm -hmm. the last four or five years <clears throat> has affected the world of Scientology. And I've never really, I guess I've never been able to have that specific conversation, mm -hmm. um, with someone who just left Scientology. And here's what I mean. Mm -hmm. I think, um, conservatives who are in Scientology tend to interpret Hubbard wrote in a way that supports their conservatism. And yeah. then I think liberals who are Scientologists uh, interpret everything Hubbard wrote in a way to support liberalism. Yep. And when the world was less divided politically, that probably, that was never really a problem in the world of Scientology. That's right. But my God, the only Scientologists I know of right now are rabid, rabid far-right conservatives. And I just have to wonder if how that has fractured the Scientology membership. Because you cannot tell me that um, uh, San Francisco Scientologists are conservative. I don't buy. I won't buy it for a second. Nope, no way. They're not. Um, when I was when I was in Philly, there was a, a lot of uh, no one really talked about politics, but there were for sure people I know who were very liberal Scientologists. Yep. And um, and I just uh, it, it was just never a problem because people didn't spend a lot of time arguing about politics. But I got to tell you that I have not. I can't think of one Scientologist whether it's someone I know or someone on social media who's out speaking in support of Democrats or liberalism. The only ones you hear about are Republicans and conservatism. And that has to be creating some massive internal conflict. Huge. It just has to. I, I am positive, at least in the United States, I am positive that that is the case, probably in the UK as well, because they've got very similar um, thinking and and reasons for it right with immigration and finance and and big data and social media and all the other things and then you throw COVID on top of it and the authoritarianism and and it just people's heads explode so you get these divisions and i think that's where that's coming from and i am positive scientologists are our heads are exploding over it too because science because because if it if they weren't 
we would have to then say or or think that somehow Scientology was a filter or a buffer or a bulwark against that kind of crazy. And it's not. It's the exact opposite. Scientology it, it, it sort of bullhorns that crazy and the conspiracy theories and stuff. I mean, you know, we, we've talked at length about the conspiracy theories and the mindset of Scientologists. And that's a paranoid, anti-establishment, anti-government viewpoint. You know? right. And even if you have progressive values, you come into Scientology and you start believing the anti-establishment conspiracy theory type thinking, and you align it with your progressive values, but you're still going to go in that direction. You know, and I, I, mean, I speak from personal <laughs> that's experience right. on that. Yeah, that's right. And even if you're if you're a Scientologist and you're uh, very progressive, very liberal, um, y- you are yet at the same time a part of an organization that um, <laughs> doesn't. Uh, it seems to anyway, no matter which party you're a part, let, let's say you're let's say you're a conservative Republican and yet you're in an organization that's run by the Sea Org. The Sea Org is probably one of the best executed exa- real world examples of communism. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's actually true. That's funny. That is actually funny because it's true. I never thought about it through that lens, but that is actually kind of what the Sea Org is. And and if you want to say communism doesn't work, look, I'm going to be the first person to tell you you're right. You know, it just doesn't. Humans aren't built for communism. It just doesn't really work for us. So it's 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 a great idea. It works in small groups, you know, communes, little frontier societies. But otherwise, forget it. It just doesn't pan out. And history is the proof positive of that. We see it over and over and over and over and over again. So, yeah. Yeah. And then, um, you know, it, and, and then if, if you're on on the left and you're a member of Scientology or the C organization, well, you're part of an organization that doesn't value rights or liberty at all That's right. in, in actual practice. That's right. You know, but Hubbard wrote so many contradicting stuff that no matter what you believe, you can sort of seize onto certain things that he said and go, this reinforces my existing beliefs, That's right. you know? Um, and, satis- and then and, sometimes and most importantly it, <laughs> satisfies my emotional needs. Exactly. It's probably a good thing for Miscavige that he hasn't had to hold these international events because like I, I remember one time, well, because then he he never has to worry about accidentally saying something that offends people on political lines. That's right. You know, that's right. I remember at one international event, he threw out some comments and I'm having trouble remembering whether it was uh, critical of one of the wars Bush uh, W had gotten us into or um, I think it was critical of it. Mm-hmm. And I remember going, oh, shit, I know a lot of people who support that war. Mm-hmm. I'm surprised he's up here saying anything political at all. Yep. And that was 20 years ago Yep. or whatever. I, yep. Um, now it would be so dangerous for him to even address um, the, the state of society. Yep. Because everyone's so divided on the causes of the state of society. Yep. That, uh, I'll be surprised if they go back to doing any big live events uh, un- until they build LRH Hall. Who knows? Who, who really knows? You know, that's an interesting point. And we'll see how anxious Miscavige is to get in front of the audience again, because I know that it's also such an important retention technique for him to puff up them with the, with the false stats and all the bullshit. And I'm positive that there must be some we're back kind of event coming, you know, now, yeah. that, now that now that everything is opening up again, but he has this is if there is anywhere, well we'll we'll judge how this goes, but the safest course for Miscavige is going to be the middle line where he says things that can be interpreted in different ways. Planetary bull bait is not just misinterpreted or reinterpreted by non Scientologists. Internally, that could mean different things to different Scientologists, too. So it's that kind of phrasing that's going to be really important. And I'm sure he's got Dan Sherman on overtime right now working out that kind of stuff so that he does, you know, walk that middle line and you can interpret what he says in lots of different ways that satisfies your pre-existing belief. Yeah. But could you imagine if he were to do an international event and dedicate any meaningful amount of time to patting the church on the back for everything it did to keep people safe from COVID, you're going to have half the audience going, what the fuck is this? Why do we, why, why are we pretending 
to have saved people from the globalist hoax designed to trick everybody into getting vaccinated to control the population. Like, that's right. What the fuck's going on with this guy? That's right. That's <laughs> and that's why he. That's why we're going to have to see how he does it because it's. It, is he going to? Is he going to commit? Is he going to go all in on that and alienate a bunch of Scientologists, or is he going to try to walk that middle line? That's the choice he has right now that he has to figure out. He's already kind of pushed in that virtue signaling direction, but he could still pull it back. You know, it, it, yeah. it's a little because because you could always get away with. Yeah, we just did that for the walks. We just did that for the walks, it, right? Except so, the walks aren't the ones watching the event. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm just saying, you know, it's all about that PR area control. It's all about creating those big effects in the world. As long as you can convince Scientologists that the world is getting on your side, that's the messaging of those events that they that the Scientologists want to hear. You know, is the That's world true. is on our side. That's so true. how he does that, we're going to have to, we'll, we'll see. We're definitely going to see. It'll be interesting if nothing else, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, it, but, but this whole subject is, is TNT. It, it absolutely is. And if, and if Miscavige doesn't recognize that, or, and Osa probably doesn't because they're so fucking clueless. But if Miscavige doesn't recognize that, then this could be, um, he he could really put his foot in it, and that could make things ten times worse. He could, because um, even yeah. some of the people, um, and well, all, I mean, all the orgs did lock down. But I've spoken to some people in those orgs who were like, "Yeah, you know, we had to lock down and everything, and yeah, we have really strict, um, you know, COVID protocols. And if you get sick, you get a comev. But half the people still don't really believe it anyway. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, it's like it's like um, it's like uh, oh gosh. Um, well, it's a common of offense to get a sunburn. Oh right, right. Remember that if it prevents you from doing your post, that's right. right. Yeah. And, and how many people? And I actually know people who got comev after Sea Org Day because they did because they got to you know they had I mean one idiot almost had you know second degree burns. He was such an idiot about it, uh, and he got comev right. And so. Um, so yeah, it's this weird, you know, you don't have to believe in it. It's all a hoax, but you better not get it. Right. Right. And, it, and, and see, that's remarkable. Like, uh, we're just I, I don't, <laughs> belaboring the same point, but it's like, so you're putting in very, very strict protocols. You're following the protocols and you're still going to get in trouble if you get sick. Doesn't make any fucking sense. Of course not. But that's the authoritarianism. Yeah, it's, it's the strain. It's, yeah, it's not whether through. you. It's not whether you were determined to not have been following the rules. It's even if you did follow the rules and you get sick, boom, that's you're right. in trouble. It's like, oh man, exactly. How did we put up with it for so long? <laughs> well, as you and I think, it, 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 if anybody's out there thinking, "Oh my God, how do they possibly mm -hmm. reconcile this? How does this make any sense?" I'll tell you, probably the thing that exists in the Scientologist's mind is that constant refrain. You are always responsible for your own condition. Yeah. And that's how they resolve all that. You know? Yeah. Ultimately, it's on you. It's true. Yeah. So that's how they make it make sense, even though I think we've shown pretty clearly here that it doesn't really make sense. You know, yeah. It's contradictory nonsense. Aaron, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today about all of this and catch me up on all of this and, and everybody else. And I want to return back to where we started because I want to um, really put there for everybody to watch Aaron over the next few months because things are about to get interesting. And, um, and you'll, you know, you'll formally do your process and, and, uh, and do the campaign and stuff. And I will be uh, certainly cheering you from Denver here. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. and so just to answer some of the questions people usually always ask related to the campaign. By the time the campaign starts, there um, first of all, once it all starts, I'll be publishing it all over my YouTube channel, Growing Up in Scientology, um, my Twitter, which is Growing Up in SCN, or just look up Aaron Smith Levin on Twitter, you'll find me. Um, you know, in, in addition to my Facebook personal profile, I have a page. You know, you can do the page. So anything I put out about the campaign will be on all of those platforms. If you follow me on any of them, you won't miss it. Um, there will, uh, campaign donations cannot be made or accepted until the campaign officially starts. So okay. once the campaign starts, those systems will all be set up and be heavily promoted. 
Um, I will be creating a political committee. That's what they call it. Uh, usually you'd call it a political action committee. All right. But for local stuff, it's just called a political committee. Um, where donation, once I have that set up, people can donate to that vehicle even before the campaign starts. Um, I think it, the way I'll describe the political committee will be, it'll be a committee set up to support any candidate willing to publicly um, work to get Scientology's tax exempt status removed. Um, on a state election or a local election like this, the candidate themselves is allowed to operate the political committee. It's not like at the federal level where they have to be totally separate. Right. Okay. So anyway, once these things are in place, then they will be uh, appropriately promoted um, and at the right time. So right. Th those are the questions I, I usually get. Awesome. Thanks for putting those out there because I know I would get those questions if you didn't say that. So good. And um, and good. And I will put in the show notes, you know, links to your uh, Twitter and YouTube channel so people can just click and go directly to those. And um, and I just want to say, you know, uh, outright loud and proud. I endorse Aaron <laughs> already. <laughs> and uh, and I really, really hope that you are a success at this. Thank you very much. Absolutely, man. All right, guys. Uh, you know, all the usual outro things here. Support the channel. It's 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 what I do. And, and with your support, it's what allows me to do it. So thank you very much for coming around and listening. I hope you guys got something out of this. Uh, and I will see you next week. Bye-bye. I want to give a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Dream Realty. Oh, wait. That's me. I've been a real estate investor for over 20 years. I bought my first investment property when I was 20 years old. For the last 15 years, I've been buying and selling my own properties all over Clearwater and Tampa Bay. If you're looking to buy a home or sell a home and you'd like to work with me, get in touch and I'll get it done for you. Thanks again to everyone who supports this channel and thank you for watching. Okay, if you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see a, a different one of my videos, uh, oh, then you could click right inside here. If you have subscribed or not, subscribe right here. Bye!